Hi folks and welcome back to the Advantage Applications channel. My name's Rich and this is my second video in my series on creating a custom solution using Microsoft Access as a front end and SharePoint as a back end. And in this video we're going to cover how to create relationships between the tables that are linked to SharePoint lists both using the relationship designer and also in queries and form controls. And we're also going to look at some caveats or some things to be aware of when you're working with forms and form controls that are linked to or bound to data in SharePoint lists. And I also wanted to say thanks to everybody that's been checking out these videos and subscribing to the channel. It means a lot to me. I'm really surprised that it's taken off like it has, especially to the people that have become members to the channel. And if you want to become a member, there's going to be a link in the description where you can do that. And what you get as a member is you get access to all of the source files and all of the practice files that I create in these videos that we go over. So it's kind of handy if you want to practice and you don't want to reinvent the wheel, or you can even use those things as springboards for your own projects. But anyway, it means a lot. I appreciate it. And uh, without any further hesitation, let's go ahead and jump in. So this is what our tables looked like at the end of our last video when we had linked them back up to the SharePoint lists. So now, if we wanted to reestablish the relationships between these tables, there are several ways that we can do this. The most obvious way is through the Relationship Designer under Database Tools. And you would do this just like you would if these were native access tables now. You can just click and drag the tables from the navigation pane right into the Designer. Then you can click and drag the Primary key to the Foreign key and define the relationship parameters. I honestly don't use this method very often. I tend to just define these relationships as needed in my query definitions or in some form controls like combo boxes and list boxes. I'll show you an example of what I mean. I've created this form to enter events into the database. The event date field auto populates with the current date and time and the reported by field auto populates with the user ID of whoever's logged on to the workstation. Event location is a combo box that's populated by data in TBL location. Event description is just a text field. And event type is a list box populated by the data in TBL event type. Multiple event items can be selected per event submission, but for this record, I'll just choose broken equipment. I click Submit and the data is stored in TBL Event Details. And in TBL Trigger Event Type, where we store the ID from TBL Event Details as a foreign key, as well as the IDs of the event types that were selected from that list box I showed you earlier. So we see this last record has an Event Details ID of 11, which is what we saw in Event Details table, and an Event Type ID of 4 which if we go to that table, we see is broken equipment, which is what I selected when I submitted the event. And again, I'm just giving you an overview of what this app does. So now let's say I want to provide users with a form where they can define a few parameters and get back query data based on those parameters. I could use something like this where users can define a date range select the location from a combo box, and select an event type from a combo box as well. But let's say I only want items to show up in this combo box that have actually been submitted for the selected location. To do this, I would need to set up a query with relationships between the tables. And this is where I typically define my relationships, if I'm working with tables linked to SharePoint lists. So if you want to use the relationship designer, by all means do. I'm just showing you what I tend to do. Okay, so first we'll set up the row source for the location combo box. I'll double click TBL location to select it from the links tab. Next I'll select its primary key for the query and the text value field, in this case location. I'll make it so the values are listed alphabetically, then close the query designer and save my changes. Now I need to make sure my bound column is set to 1 since that's where the primary key was in our query structure. Then in the format tab I'll change the column count to 2 since we had two fields in our row source query. Then set the column widths and since I don't need the first field to be visible I'm going to set it to 0 and I'll make the second field have a width of 1. Now if we check our work we'll see that the location combo box does list the locations alphabetically and the IDs are not visible. 
So now to make sure the items that display in the event type combo box are only those events that have occurred at the selected location, I'll need to create another query. So I'll go into the row source property for the event items combo box, and we'll need all of the tables we have so far for this query. We're going to resize and arrange these to make them a little easier to work with. The first relationship I need to establish is between TBL event details and TBL trigger event type, so that we only get query results where the values for instances where event details ID is equal in both tables. Next, we relate TBL trigger event type to TBL event type, and we'll need the event type ID to store as our combo box value, and the event type text to display in the combo box's list so users aren't just looking at ID numbers. Now we need to relate TBL event details to TBL location on location ID. And we bring down location ID into our query grid since this is what we're going to use as our criteria. And the way that we'll do that is to make sure that our query results are only for the location ID that matches what is selected in our parameters form. If you aren't quite familiar with what I'm doing here, let me know in the comments and I'll make a video on how to use form control values and values returned from functions as query criteria. Okay, we want to set our query's unique values property to true because we don't want multiple instances of the same event type showing up in our combo box. And we'll confirm that our bound column property is set to 1 since that is the position of the field containing the event type ID. We'll change our column count to 3 since that's how many fields there are in our query. And since I only want the event type text to show up in our combo box, I'll set the first column or field width to 0, the second to 1, which is our event text field, and the last one to 0. Now when we check our results, we see that only those event types that were submitted for the selected location show up and there are no duplicates in the list items. So that's basically the way that I prefer to handle relationships between tables that are linked to SharePoint lists. I'm sure there are some who like to define the relationship once in the relationship designer and they'd be done. But like I said, I've personally had unexpected results when I do that and then have to modify the table design. All right, now let's look at a special caveat to be aware of when inserting new records through forms and controls that are bound to tables linked to SharePoint lists. When a user submits an event, all of the data in the controls on the left of the form are going to be written to TBL event details. Then the ID for that newly inserted record is stored in a variable in the VBA code. Next, for each selected event type in the list box, a new record is inserted into TBL trigger event type, along with the ID of the record we inserted into TBL event details. And that's how we adhere to the one-to-many relationship between TBL event details and TBL trigger event type. If TBL event details was a local table, getting the identity of the newly inserted record would be rather straightforward. I've set up a local copy of that table to show you how it would work. We'll fill in some test data here, and click Submit. Now we create and set a record set variable to TBL event details. Then we add a new record, and right at that moment a new ID number is generated even before that record's actually created in the table. So if I went to the immediate window and printed the value for event details ID for the record currently in memory, I would see the value of 2. So I could go ahead and store that value in a variable to use later when we're inserting records into TBL trigger event type. But with tables linked to SharePoint lists, it's just a bit more involved since no ID is generated until the record is actually inserted into the SharePoint list. What we need to do is earmark the record as we insert it so we can look it up later and get the ID value. I cover this in depth in my video, How to Get the Identity of a Newly Inserted Record in a SharePoint List Linked to an Access Database and I'll put a link to that video in the description in case you'd like to check it out. But basically, I create an earmarked field in the SharePoint list, and this is just a plain text field. Then in code, I assign a value that will be unique to the record. I like to use the currently logged in user along with the current date and time down to one thousandth of a second, so there's really no chance of this value being accidentally duplicated by another user in the system at the same time. Next, I insert the earmark value along with the other data points when I create the new record. 
Then I can use that to look up the identity of the inserted record and use it when I create records for selected event types. So just a little more involved, but certainly nothing too difficult. Okay, there's only one other thing that I do differently when working with forms bound to or working with SharePoint data. It was usually considered best practice to have tables that populate combo boxes and list boxes reside in the front end file. That way performance was improved by not needing to send and receive data over the network just to populate these controls. But I found that the performance game is minimal and you have to make sure every user gets an updated front end file anytime there's a change to the table data that populates those list boxes or combo boxes. So I move all my tables out to SharePoint and just link to them, even the ones that populate controls. And in my next video in this series, I'm going to cover how to make sure your users always have the most up-to-date and correct version of the front-end file, how I distribute this type of solution, and also how to kick users out of the database in case you need to. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and if you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe. Take care.